difference. Give the Lord a hand. Go ahead and sit down and open your Bibles uh, or turn in your devices to the book of 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. This is my last message on the series of healing in the atonement. I'm talking to you about divine healing that God wants you to be well. I could talk to you for weeks and weeks and weeks. I recommended a book called Christ the Healer last week that I think is one of the very best books written on the subject of healing. And it was written over, I think, right a little, almost 100 years ago, a little over 100 years ago. Absolutely fantastic book on healing. I recommend it. You can get it, I believe you can get it on Amazon. But the thing that we, we started all of this to talk about the atonement. The atonement is the act that Jesus Christ did on the cross in the grave and his resurrection. It is what Jesus did for you. In the act of all this, with, with all that taking place, where Jesus died on the cross, Jesus was buried, Jesus was raised from the dead, Jesus paid for and provided for you these things, these four things, salvation, deliverance, healing, and provision. We've talked in detail uh, quite regularly about salvation. Deliverance is that the power of God wants to deliver you from your old man, from your flesh, from the issues of life, from your habits. And then we have healing, which has to do with divine healing, which is physical, emotional, mental healing. God has provided healing for us. And then provision. So I'm going to take a couple of weeks starting next week and talk to you about the God who provides for you. God the provider, God the rewarder, God that, that will touch and, and meet your needs. But today I want to wrap up this talk on divine healing. Again, it's not uh, the end of the subject. We could go for weeks and weeks and weeks, but I wanted you to understand some things about healing, and I need to talk to you about communion. Here is, here is the pivotal scriptures that we are going to talk about today. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, here's what it says, verse 27. Talking about communion. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, for the reason of not discerning the Lord's body, for the reason of not understanding communion, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep or are dead. That's frightening. Here's what it says. Here's what the scripture says. Because you're not understanding the purpose and the, the reason of communion, some of you are physically sick. Some of you are weak, low energy, have different problems with your blood sugar levels, different problems with your body because you don't get communion. And some of you have even died earlier than you're supposed to die because of not doing communion right. So I thought I would explain these verses to you. Wouldn't that be good? It starts in the beginning of the same chapter, but let me, let me first share a couple things. I want to continue to talk about salvation, deliverance, healing, provision, and what God has provided. If you remember in Easter, I shared with you about the four cups, the four cups that are done at Passover. And those four cups represent these four things, salvation, deliverance, healing, and provision. Of those four cups, Jesus combined them all into one cup, the cup of atonement, the cup of blessing, his cup, the cup that he took. The member he even said to the father, you know, if the, you know, I'll take this cup, but if there's any other way, let it pass, but uh, I'll take it. And he put all this into his life, into his sacrifice, and he died on the cross. And the Bible clearly teaches us that what happened is that Jesus bore our sins and he bore our sicknesses. He bore our transgressions. He bore our pain. He took this to the cross. So God has provided methods and a system of healing for your body, for your mind, for your emotions. God is one that wants to make sure you are well and that you live well. Sickness is not of God. God is not pro-sickness. Sickness is not something that God wants to use to teach you something. He has the Holy Spirit. Sickness is not something that God wishes for you to maintain for a while. He wants you to have your healing speedily. 
And I've given you many scriptures about these things. We come to one that I consider to be one of the most difficult scriptures in the Bible that deal with healing. And that is, Paul says that you guys are taking communion incorrectly, and it has resulted in your church having sickness in it and people being weak, and some have even died earlier than they're supposed to. And here's how most people have interpreted that scripture. Because man is really good of making everything about him. Man's really good at that. You know, we're very, very good at making everything always about us. So the first thing that they do, and all the commentators that you will read, you'll find that they always will, will put it all on you. You better not have any sin in your life. You better get holy. You better get clean. You better not take that communion. If there's any sin in your life, if there's any anger, if there's any judgment, get it out before you take communion because you could get sick. I, I even know the people that will not take communion because they don't feel worthy enough to take communion. So they prefer never having it because they don't want judgment to be brought on them for not taking it because they're not worthy of it because of what Christ died and what Christ did for them. So I thought it'd be best to look at this. And here's where we're going to start. We're going to start at the very, very beginning of the chapter. This chapter, chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians, is broke down into two, two sections. The first section it starts in verse 1 and it goes all the way to verse 16. And that section talks about ladies, women with long hair and shaved hair. Did you know that has to do with communion? So, e, e, never mind. <laughs> the, the next section, starting at verse 17, going to the end of the chapter, has to do with communion. But here's, I'd like you to, to look at these two sections. They begin with an extremely important statement. Would you listen very, very closely? How many have ever read 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and read this? Or maybe you don't know what's in it, but I'll tell you real, real, real quick. The first part of chapter 11, Paul says that the head of every woman is the man and the woman needs to have her hair covered. And if she doesn't have her hair covered, then she is um, and she prophesies or prays. It's a shame. You know that you know that stuff. Yeah. I sent you a text yesterday and hey, read it. I hope you read it. Anyway, let's look at it. Verse one. Verse one says, imitate me just as I also imitate Christ in a, my a book or my version of the Bible, New King James, they're throwing that into the previous chapter. The chapters and verses weren't written by Paul. They were put in there so we could use them as reference points. Look at verse two. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things. Look at verse 17. Now giving these instructions, I do not praise you. So he's going to talk about something that he's happy that they're doing, and then he's going to talk about something that he's not happy that they're doing. So let's go at verse 2. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things, that you, and keep the traditions just as I delivered them to you. But I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ. The head of a woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonors his head. But every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head, for that is one that is the same as if her head were shaved. For if a woman is not covered, let her also be shorn. But if she is shameful for, but it, if it is shameful for a woman to be shorn or shaved, let her be covered. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God. But woman is the glory of man. For man is not from woman, but woman from man. Nor was man created for the woman, but the woman for man. Let's stop there. Ladies, all get hats on. Do whatever the man says. No more short hair grow it long, and you know, and on and on. And these scriptures have been used and interpreted that way for many, many, many years to make women less of important in the church. It continues with some more really interesting things. Look at verse 9. Nor was man created for the woman, but woman for the man, 
For this reason, the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. Nevertheless, neither is man independent of woman, nor woman independent of man in the Lord. For as a woman came from man, even so man also comes through woman. But all things are from God. Okay, let's, no, let's keep reading. Let's see if this whole thing in our heads, then we can explain it. Judge among yourselves, is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not even nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a dishonor to him? But if a woman has long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given to her for a covering. But if anyone seems to be contentious, we have no such custom, nor do the churches. Okay, so the story comes down to this. Paul's writing, he says to them, all these things about the, the woman and the man, and he says that the covering or the head of the man is God and the head of the woman is man. And then that the woman has hair as her covering and that she's not supposed to pray or prophesy unless her head is covered. And it's shameful if a man pr prays or prophesies if his head is covered. It's shameful if a man has long hair and a woman has short hair. So it gets very confusing, doesn't it? Okay, so let's just do a timeout and take a breath. Back up a couple things. When Paul wrote the letter of 1 Corinthians, he wrote a letter of correction, a letter of discipline, a letter of encouragement. The entire letter has been preserved by the Holy Spirit and been placed in the Bible for us. The entire letter has. There are sections of this that deal with certain things that aren't necessarily as they appear, but if you would just read it slower, it makes a whole lot of sense. The other thing that you have to understand, and this is where a lot of people get confused, there is no Greek word that makes a difference between a woman and a wife. So when the Bible talks about, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, that a woman should not prophesy, should not teach in the church, um, should not talk in the church, let her ask her husband when she gets home, what do you do with the women who have no husband? There isn't the, there's no way of, in the Greek, it's, it's in the language of it that you understand, is he talking to a wife or talking to women in general? And some of the scriptures that have been used for a husband and wife have been used on women in general and put women in general under a bondage that they were never intended to have. So let's back up to the opening statement of Paul. Verse 2. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the traditions. What's that word? Tradition. What is it? Tradition. It's not a law. It's not a commandment. What is it? Tradition. Traditions. Traditions. That you keep the traditions. That you keep the traditions. And now he quotes and says and reinforces a what? Tradition. A tradition. Now, let's... Go to his closing statement after the tradition is communicated. Go to the closing statement. Drop down to verse 16. But if anyone seems to be contentious, in other words, if anyone doesn't agree with me about what I'm saying, if anyone wants to change what I'm saying about my tradition, we have no such custom, nor do the churches of God. Paul is saying, I'm giving you, Corinth, a tradition, but we don't have this custom in the churches. Paul never talks about this in any other letter with any other the other churches. He never enforces for the women to have their head covered. He never tells them, you have to have this covered. But yet we have an entire tradition and a denomination and a belief system called the Catholic Church who for centuries made women put something over their head based off of this. But it's a tradition. Why in the world did Paul give, give Corinth a tradition to follow? Why would he do that? Because of culture. 
all because of culture. It has to do with culture. It has to do with the culture of the day and the culture of what's happening. What was taking place in the city of Corinth, it was very, very common, if you understand some of the religions that were happening in the city of Corinth and throughout all of Asia and the other parts of the known world at that time, temple prostitutes were very, very common. And in Corinth, the temple prostitutes, most of them would shave their heads. And when you're in the community, when you're in an interacting with people and you have a shaved head, people know that you are a temple prostitute. So Paul is saying as a tradition, the tradition is women with shaved heads are not covered. There is no covering. There is no husband. There is nobody watching. There's nobody but um, a madam. Or they call them pimps. That's the only covering this person has. There's a religious, they would go to the temple, they would um, bring their offering, they'd go to one of the rooms, they would have um, temple worship (laughs) together, and then they, they would leave. It became really popular. All done in the name of worship. God forbid that we ever go there. Not we. We're not. United States. Let's continue. Paul says, well, see what's taking place now is you start getting these prostitutes born again. They're now coming into the church. Some of you are going, oh my God. They would let them in the church. Isn't that where we all came from? But listen real close. These ladies would start getting saved. They would come to the church. Their hair hasn't grown out. Paul says it's a tradition for them. Let's have all the women cover their hair. Then everybody's equal on an equal plane. Tradition. Not a custom that is in all practiced in other churches. Paul clearly communicates. This is not a custom that we practice in other churches. This is not something that I am enforcing, nor did he rewrite it to anyone else. But he simply says here, he says, don't you get it? Because he, he says, the head of every man is God. The head of every woman is man. And that you need to have your head covered. This is a tradition, Paul says. A tradition. Our traditions are different. Our culture is different. Today, uh, I mean, there are women who have short hair. And here's the other thing. What's long? What is defined as long? Paul just said long. I mean, what is long? Is it long shoulder length? When my wife is wearing shoulder length hair, I say she has short hair. My wife just said that she doesn't say that. So um, my definition of long hair is, is, could be different than yours. I know some people who, you know, their, their hair gets below their ears and, well, it's just too long. I got to get it cut. I know some men who, uh, I, I used to have hair below my ear. I used to have hair. <laughs> I used to have an afro. But, you know, what's long? In the military, definition of long is very different than civilian life. So if long hair is a shame, then, you know, I mean, look at all our Christian rock bands. They all need to get saved and shaved. But Paul is trying to communicate that in this community, in this area of of Asia, this part of uh, the city of Corinth and what they were dealing with, that Paul did not jump in there and try to radically change traditions and customs. He tried to make sure that they understood, let's do this as in the name of the Lord. How many times have you read about history where uh, American or British missionaries went to Africa and the African people there, women uh, didn't wear tops. And the first thing all the people want to do is tell them about Jesus and cover them up. And they don't get it. So our goal is not to change the outside person. Our goal is to change the inside person. And if the inside person is changed, the outside person will change in time. Will change in time. 
right? And we have to remember that when it comes to new Christians, somebody that's new, someone that's a baby Christian. I don't know why what we think, okay, oh, you got saved three weeks ago, two months ago, then why are you still doing this? I think that we need to let people have time to grow and, and produce fruit and to develop. I think that's really important. I understand, this is what I read, that if you have a seed of an avocado and you put it in the ground and you turn it into a tree, and the tree grows. It's seven years before you have your first fruit. I know peach trees could take a year or two. Most fruit trees take a couple of years before you actually have a fruit. And then the first fruit that comes on it, it's not very great, not very good. You know, you, you, it's got to develop and mature. Am I right? Yes. So if we're that patient with fruit trees, can't we that, be that patient with each other? Can't we let people have time to grow and time to change and time to develop? In this situation, Paul clearly states, this is a tradition that I want you to, to grasp and get. I want you to know. Now he goes into the next part. See, at verse 16, he says, look at, we have no custom, nor do the churches of God. We don't, we, we're not promoting that women need to cover their hair and cover their head and have uh, some kind of a hat on in order to pray or prophesy. I do want you to notice he didn't say that a woman couldn't prophesy. He just said, if she prays or prophesies and her head's not covered, isn't it a shame? Basically, what he's communicating is the tradition in there. For us to go deeper in this, we'd have to go into the customs and traditions of Corinth. We'd have to find the, the purpose of what's going on there. And then we'd have to study the family life and we'd have to get that for there. But Paul concludes with, I'm not promoting this in the churches. The churches have no custom. This is a custom and a tradition that they are doing. Our customs, our traditions are different. You got that part? Go to verse 17 now. Here's what he says in verse 17. Now in giving these instructions, I do not praise you. Now, I praise you that you guys are keeping the traditions and making sure that people who are coming in the church are all welcome, even the ex-temple prostitutes. I praise you that you're a, you have a tradition in your church that's making people comfortable, making, letting people come and gather together dressed any way they want, that you're not being judgmental. You're not trying to make them uncomfortable. You make everybody fit in and be relaxed. I praise you for that. Now on this, and he's going to talk about communion, I do not praise you. Here's what it says. Now in giving these instructions, I do not praise you since you come together together not for the better, but for the worse. For first of all, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and in part I believe it. So he says, the first thing I want to bring up to your attention that really bothers me, it sounds like there are some sects in your church, little divisions, little cliques, and we need to bust those up. We need, you need to welcome people and not be selective in, on your gathering together. And here's what it says. For there must also be fractions among you that those who are approved may be recognized among you. Therefore, when you come together in one place, is it not to eat the Lord's Supper? For in eating, one takes his own supper ahead of others, and one is hungry and another is drunk. And it says, what? I love that. What? We had a video of our twin granddaughters who live in Florida when they were four years old swimming in the swimming pool. And they were swimming underwater. They were, I think, three, three or four, somewhere in that age. They, and they swam across the swimming pool, uh, mostly underwater. And it was a hilarious because it looks like when they kept on going, 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 it looked like they're going to die, like they're going to drown. I mean, there were sometimes just their face was above the water and they're just kicking away, kicking away, kicking away, kicking away. And they finally make it all the way to the other side. So we have another granddaughter who's watching the video. And at the time she's three. And she's watching them swim across the pool and she literally does this. What? <laughs> what? What? <laughs> just like that. Hand on the hip. What? 
just staring at the video. I see Paul. What? He goes, I hear that you guys are coming for communion and some of you are taking massive amounts of bread and some of you are taking massive amounts of wine. So it tells us that this time in their tradition, in their culture, they were using wine because they were drinking the, the juice of communion and getting drunk. So they're drinking wine. So some of them are like, hey, you know, uh, in our culture, we do not serve wine. One of the reasons we do not serve wine is because we don't know people's backgrounds. There are a lot of people who would be, uh, because of their addictive personality or addictive background or their freedom of alcohol and they, or they have, they have been sober or however term you want to use it, but they've been delivered from that, we are not going to be in the way of interfering with what's going on. We serve grape juice. We serve white grape juice because it stains less. So, uh, you may go, why is it not purple? Why is it white? Because if you spilt it, it's harder to clean when it's purple. Or it's easier if it's white. That's a lot. That's all. So just practical. So well, I think it should be purple. <laughs> so here's what, here's what happens. He goes, some of you are, are supposed to be taking the Lord's Supper and you're taking the chalice, you're taking the, 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 the wine. <laughs> Forget the four cups, I'm going for six. And you guys are, in, and Paul goes, what? He's just shocked. And then look what he says. Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? He says, what are you doing at church for? Go home. I think that's hilarious too. Or do you despise, listen to this, or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I do not praise you. He says, you guys are missing what we're supposed to do at communion. Listen. For I receive from the Lord that which I delivered to you that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. Take eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now, when we were at our Easter service, I explained to you the breaking of the bread and which piece of bread Jesus took, and when he broke it, what, it was, what he was proclaiming. And then we also know from scriptures from the previous weeks after or the, um, that we've gone in this series and at, um, preceding Easter, we've looked at scriptures that deal with redemption and healing in the atonement, healing in the redemption. And we know this, that the breaking of the bread and, the, and giving it to us and us eating of that bread, the purpose of it is the promise of God to touch you with salvation, deliverance, healing, and provision. It is the promise of God to touch you. Salvation, deliverance, healing, and provision. That's the purpose of it. Then it says this. Here's what Paul says. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper. So we know this is the third cup. Saying this cup is the new covenant. Mark those words. New covenant. New covenant. This is the new covenant. This is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink in remembrance of me. What we know from Paul, who was told by Jesus, which is pretty good authority, that Jesus said the night that he was betrayed, and he gave them the cup. When he gave them that cup, Jesus said out of his mouth, this is the new covenant. And there, that means that there's a difference between the old and the new. This is the new covenant that is in my blood, that is paid for, bought for, purchased. I am the living covenant. Jesus said, this is the new covenant. Then he says this, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. 
What is it you are proclaiming? You are proclaiming the bread and you are proclaiming the cup. You are proclaiming salvation, proclaiming deliverance, proclaiming healing, proclaiming provision. You are proclaiming the acts of God, not the acts of man. But what have we done? What have we have people have done? What have we as the church of America that came from England, that came from all the history that we have, what is it we have done as the Catholics, as the Lutherans, as the Presbyterians, as the Assemblies of God, what have we done? We've made it about us. We actually think that we can come to the Lord's Supper, examine our own selves, remove sin, and now I'm worthy to take your bread and drink your cup. How arrogant is that? For you to think, for you to think it's about you. Come to me and I will make you kick your, get yourself all cleaned up, get yourself all worked up, get yourself all, get all that stuff out of you. Oh, you messed up last night. Don't take communion today. When communion is the proclamation, the declaration, the receiving of salvation, deliverance, healing, and provision. It is an act of Jesus, not an act of you. So we look at what Paul says. How do you examine yourself? Paul says, therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Well, see, pastor, there it says right there. You got to get worthy. How? How do you get worthy? How do you clean your life up enough? What, think about the most clean person that you can know. The, the, the least sin in their life. Are they so clean on their own that they do not need the blood and the body of Christ? Do they go to heaven all on their own because of their, their good works, because of their behavior, because of how, who they are? No, they go by the grace of God, by the love of God, by the, by the mercy of God. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner... He who eats or drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself. So who's judging? Who's bringing judgment into you? Who's bringing, because he, he declares the judgment, weakness, sickness, and death. That's what he declares. The judgment will be weakness, sickness, and death. Who declares the judgment? Is God judging you? Is God bringing the judgment? Doesn't it say you brought it on yourself Yes, it does. <laughs> it says that you brought it. Look what it says. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy matter, eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning, not discerning, not discerning the Lord's body. Could I have one of my wonderful ushers bring me just one piece of bread and one cup, please, if you could. I appreciate that. So look at verse 30 again. For this reason, many are weak, sick among you, and many sleep. The reason is not discerning the Lord's body. The reason is you are taking, thank you, you are taking the cup and the bread in an unworthy manner. So how do I take it in a worthy manner? Quit making it about you and only make it about Jesus. As soon as you bring you into the equation, you have made it an unworthy sacrifice. When you start to say, I can't get saved. I can't get delivered. I can't get healed. God's never going to provide for me. You're doing it in an unworthy manner. When you start denying the power of the communion, when you start denying the power of the atonement, when you start saying and say, start to say, no, no, I don't believe that. I don't think it's going to happen. You're bringing judgment onto yourself. The unworthy matter is when you look at yourself and you think your sin can't be forgiven by God. When you think that your behavior cannot be washed by the blood. 
As soon as you think that you are a special human being outside all the rest, I'm more evil than any. And it's not going to work for me. You are treating this sacrifice in an unworthy manner. As soon as you deny that he wants you well, as soon as you deny that he wants to provide for you, you're treating it in an unworthy manner. When Jesus took the bread, when he took the bread and he broke it, and then he distributed the bread among his people, his disciples there, and then he took the cup. Paul's trying to say it. He says it over and over again. Look at verse 26. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread and drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the blood and the body of the Lord. As soon as you declare that this does less than Jesus himself declared, you're taking it in an unworthy manner. And Paul says, you guys aren't getting it. That's why some of you are weak, some of you are sick, and some of you have died. Why? Because you are not respecting for what Jesus did. Some of you have treated it just like supper. Oh, man, that's a great cracker. <laughs> Can I take another one of that? Oh, I need to wash that one down a couple of times. And you, you don't realize what is the purpose of communion. The entire purpose of communion is to realize you did it, Jesus. You did it for me. I believe. I believe in my salvation, my deliverance, my healing, my provision by you. You are the one that have provided. You are the one that died. You are the one that's resurrected. What has tradition taught you? What has man taught you? Man has taught you to use communion as a whip to get you to behave better. Oh, you can't have communion. Oh, you did this wrong. I'm sorry, you, you can't have holy communion. You must, you, you know, uh, now for the rest of your life, I... I understand in the Catholic Church, I don't know if it's still true, I'm not Catholic, that if you were divorced and you remarried, you can't have Holy Communion ever again. I'm not trying to get against the Catholic Church because I highly respect what they have done in history. I am against traditions that are not the custom of the church. I am against traditions or customs that are not doctrine. Doctrine is what brings life, not traditions and customs. The Bible says I am supposed to come to the communion table of the Lord and I am supposed to, to receive it in a worthy manner. I'm supposed to declare you're my healer. You're my healer. You're my provider. If I do anything less, I'm taking an unworthy manner. Quit making it about you. Make it about Jesus. It's not about you. It's about what he did for you. It is all about Jesus. This is his body and his blood, not yours. What does the body and blood represent? Forgiveness, salvation. What you need to do instead of trying to get sin out of your life and make yourself worthy that you get to come and receive communion, you need to receive because he has made you worthy. Go back to the example that Jesus gave when he said that this one rich person came into the temple and was praying and a sinner came into the temple and the sinner said, oh, forgive me of my sins, you know, and he just fell and asked for the mercy of God. The rich person said, I'm so glad I'm not like him. I tithe all the time and blah, blah, blah. And Jesus asked which one left and I'll use the word blessed. The one who just came and said, you're God, and I need you. 